The Lord, our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in a time of storm. Secure whatever will be tied, a shelter in a time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Let's say good evening to everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, Brother Jamie and I'm like set to get me all set. Hopefully I'll do okay with the new technology. Uh, but this evening, uh, I'm just glad to see everybody that's here. And uh, when I talk, I like to tell stories. And so hopefully these stories will kind of mesh into something that you can take home and learn from. And uh, by way of an introduction, I like to tell a little story. Uh, in case you didn't know it, I'm a sports fan. I like sports. In case you didn't know it. Uh, I love sports, I love competition, especially baseball, football, basketball, and now, now golf. <laughs> and now golf. Uh, some say I'm real competitive, but I don't, I don't think I'm that competitive. I just like to have a good time, and I don't like to lose. I just don't. <laughs> so. Uh, now, in sports, you have what they call a go-to guy in sports. Just about every sports have a go-to guy. Some people may call him the rock, the go-to guy in sports. When you need that free throw, that three-point shot, or a first down, a, a first down or a strikeout with the time running out, there's usually one person on the team that comes through in a tight situation. When the game is on the line, you want that, that rock guy to be there. Like MJ, you just say MJ, you know who that is. Larry Bird, Tom Brady. My favorite of all time was Willie Mays. He was my idol in the old days. I patterned myself out of Willie Mays, I would say. I was, was an outfielder, played center field, and you know, I, I thought I did all right at center field, but if you talk to my daddy, he'll tell you a story about me called In the Well. You know, most of the brothers who've talked to him know about In the Well. Darth Barry may know about a place called Frog Pond. You know what Frog Pond is. Frog Pond is a place where, <laughs> you know what Frog Pond is too, Marie, okay? Frog Pond is a place we used to have a 28 day of May celebration every year. That was our Juneteenth. We had a Juneteenth before I knew about a Juneteenth. The 28th day of May was the time we celebrated when the news of our freedom came to our area of Lower Russell County, a place called Rutherford Frog Pond. I took Janet down to Frog Pond one time and she was looking for a pond. She, was, she kept looking for a lake. It's just an area. And so my daddy was a, was a pitcher. And every one of these little towns where we grew up, like Dardenberry, Marie, and all, we grew up, they had a, a baseball team. Every little town had a baseball team. And at the end of the summer, around the 20th day of May, I guess, they would have a big get together, and the teams would have a big competition. And my daddy was a pitcher, and he, Knew I wasn't going to be much of a pitcher, but he used to come home every day after work, hit pop flies to me, just hit pop flies. And I got pretty good at catching balls. I could run them down, catch them over my head, flying down, falling down, I could catch them. So he felt pretty good that I was coming along okay, even though I wouldn't be a pitcher like he was. So one time they had the celebration out at 28th day, May celebration out at Frog Pond, and and I went down with my daddy, and I was about 15. Most of the people on the team were 18 and above. Some of them were adults. 
And lo and behold, the center fielder didn't come that day. I was late. And my daddy says, put my son out there. He's pretty good in center field. So he put me out there. And I'm about 15, I'd say. And I can't remember if it was the first pot fly that came out or not. All I remember is the ball came right to me. I didn't have to move. I didn't have to run anywhere. I didn't have to go get it. It just came right to me. And I said, man, I, my dad was out there. I heard him back there behind the home plates. That's in the well. That's in the well. Like, that means just good as caught. The ball came right to me. I don't know how I missed it to this day. I'm, just, I, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to figure it out. And talking about feeling like a rock, I felt like a grain of sand. I felt like a grain of sand out there. They took me out. After that, they took me out. The guy got a triple, knocked two runs in, and I didn't go back in the game. I went somewhere to hide. And uh, I, I felt terrible, you know. And I don't know what my dad said, but he reminds me about in the well story. So if you see him today, you ask him about in the well, he'll tell you about that. So what does all that have to do with, this, with what I'm going to be talking about tonight? About Jesus Christ being our spiritual rock. Because I felt very little, like I said, a grain of sand. Not, not real big like MJ, Willie Mae is my hero. Didn't feel like that. But Jesus is our spiritual rock. And we want to develop that story about Jesus Christ. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we'll read the first 13 verses. I want you to pay close attention to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When Brother Glasgow gave us this assignment, you know, I was always looking like, oh, I don't, we should give me somebody else's assignment. I didn't want this one. But when I started, <laughs> it's always like that with me. I'd rather get something else. But when I looked at it, I said, wow. This has got my favorite scripture in it. Anybody been in my Sunday school class, anybody been around me long enough, know that one of my favorite passages a scripture is right there in the middle of this passage. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did eat the same spiritual meat and did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with men of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the extent, to the intent, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be you idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Neither murmur as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, examples as they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he falls. There has no temptation taken you, but as such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Verse 13 is one of my favorite scriptures. There's no temptation that comes in our lives that we can't bear as Christians. And I know that in my own life, there's no temptation that you can't overcome. God will provide a way to overcome it 
or he'll provide a way for you to escape it. I've seen that time and time again. Other passage I like is verse 12. It says, wherefore let him think as he stand and take heed lest he falls. No matter how strong you are, how, 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 how strong you think you are, everybody has some kind of temptation, some kind of weakness that the devil will, will, ploy, will, will play on. But, but we got to, you'll see Jesus is our rock. We're going to develop this narrative as we go. We have a blessing that Jesus is a rock that will help us in the times of temptation, in the times of struggle, and all of those things. Let's, let's look at uh, Psalms 78, which is basically a summary of all the, the things that the children of Israel went through when they came out of Egypt into the wilderness and it, trying to get to the promised land. It's a, basically a summary. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 13 is kind of a summary of what they were going through, how they just murmured and did so many things against God's will, and he wouldn't let most of them go to the promised land because of their murmuring, their sin, and their uh, disobedience. But Psalm number uh, 78, let's go there. And it's a long reading, but it's a summary of that whole trek from Egypt to the promised land. Psalm 78. And we won't read it all. I got some verses that are circled. I want to just read them as fast as I can. Verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the word of my mouth. Go to verse 6. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. So God wanted them to let the thing sink in and pass it on to their children so it would be something important. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Verse 8, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their hearts aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Verse 10, they kept not the covenant of, of God and refused to walk in his law and, for, and forgot his law, forgot his work and his wonders. That's key, I want you to remember. And forgot his works and his wonders that he had show, showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan, he divided the sea and caused them to pass through. And he made the waters to stand as a heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depth. That's the rock where the water came out. You can find that over in, in uh, Exodus chapter 17 by when Moses struck the rock, but that's what it's referring to. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud and also the night with a light of fire. He clayed a rock in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depth. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And look what they did in verse 17. Of all of this, and they sinned yet more against him by provoking him, by provoking the most high in the wilderness. Out of all of those blessings, they sinned more against him by provoking the most high in the wilderness. Verse 18. And they tempted God in their hearts by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God and they said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he spoke, smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the people heard this, and therefore the Lord heard this, and he was wroth. God was not pleased with them. Let's skip on over to verse 32. There's a lot of reading. I want you to go home and read, read chapter, Psalm 7, 8, just a summary of that. But in verse 32, for all this, they still sinned after all these blessings and believe not for his wondrous works. Verse 33, and they remember not that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Keep that in mind, Psalm 78.
when they escaped out of Egypt and they went into the wandering in the wilderness, God was not happy with them for their lack of faith and their trust, and their lack of trust despite all of the abundant blessings that God had provided for them and all of the life-saving miracles that he had done. Over and over, he blessed them, but many of them failed to acknowledge his goodness beyond just lip service. That was the plight of the ones in Psalm 78. God was with them according to the scriptures, giving them protection, direction, food, refuge, and water for survival. He gave them water for physical survival. You know, we need water in order to survive. They estimate that a man can live three to six days with, with, without water. You can go three to six days. If you're real strong, you may get an extra day in there. Food, you may go, you know, three weeks, maybe five weeks without food. But water, we'll say three to six days you can live without water. By then, you die of thirst, kidneys shut down. You need water for spiritual survival. Keep that in mind. Now, uh, I gotta make sure I do this right. Let's see, this is kind of new here. Now, Jamie told me not to lose. Oh, who saw it? Thank you. He, t he told me not to lose it. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you, that's how Janet helps me out at home. <laughs> I go to the refrigerator, I'm looking at something that's right there in front of me. She, she can find it all the time. Okay, now let's see. We're going to talk about the spiritual rock eventually. But I want to talk about the difference between a small rock and a large rock. And let's see if we'll, this will work. That's a small rock. That's about how I felt. I think I felt a little smaller than that rock. <laughs> Down in Frog Pond. <laughs> felt smaller than that rock, man. Yeah. But let's see. The next one, that's a big rock there. That's a big rock. You see the people down under it. Can you see them? That's a big rock. All right. I don't know if that's one of them Photoshop rocks or not, but I'm, I'm hoping that's a real rock. But it suffices it to say it illustrates what I want you to see. A big rock like that, a huge rock like that, can be a hiding place from dangers. You can hide behind that rock. It can be a refuge. It can be a shield from incoming darts, arrows, and spears. That kind of rock can be a shade and overbearing heat. You can see those people are in the shade right there. But it also can be a dry place in a blowing rain. In a barren desert, it can be a source of direction, a guidepost that can be trusted, or can, can be depended upon as a location or a marker in a vast desert. If you go in there, you say, well, I remember there's a rock in there someplace, and from that rock, I know I go due east from there, I'll be at my destination. So you can use markers, a big rock like that, but that other rock, you, you might not even find it the next time you go down that way. All those uh, attributes of a huge rock, but they, these attributes that I just went over can be applied to Jesus Christ as well, but much, much more. Those attributes are like refuge, protection, guidance, those of that nature, but much more for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our spiritual rock, and he can be counted upon, depended upon, and trust it in good times and in bad times. Now let us look at just a few of the reasons we can make that statement that why Jesus can be counted upon at all times, good, bad, and, and just happy times. Number one, I got about, oh, 11 of these. First one I want to read is why we can... Uh, use Jesus as our spiritual rock because nature itself obeys Jesus. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 through 27. 
If nature obeys him, we can use him as a, our rock. Matthew chapter 8. Let's see, verse 23. And when he had, and when he was entered into a ship, and his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, and, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled at saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? A person that the nature obeys, the winds and the wave obey him, that's someone that can be trusted as your rock. Reading further in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 to 32. Even the demons obey Jesus. Let's start in verse 28. And when he had come to the other side into the country of the Jer Jerusalem, there met him two possessed with de devils coming out of the tomb, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Are thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished into the water. He cast out the demons from the those men, just by saying one word, just, just one word, go. And they left and went into the, uh, the herd. Another reason we can count on him as our spiritual rock is we know that he has power over disease. Jesus healed the sick, caused the lame to walk again, returned the sight to the blind with just a touch or word. Jesus can be counted on as our rock because he defeated death. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, 55. Uh, well, we'll read that briefly. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. Then shall he be brought, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Skip to verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, our rock. Another victory over death is the raising of Lazarus Lewis in John chapter 11, verse 38, beginning. Hope you're there with me. John chapter 11, starting verse 38. But therefore again, groaning in himself, Coming to the grave, it was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take away, take ye away the stone, Martha. The sister of him that was dead said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Shall I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou and I knew that thou heareth me always, but because of the people which standeth by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when Jesus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. That's a rock that we can count on. We just got a few more. This is for me now. I hope it's helping you because it helped me. Looking at some of the things why we can count on Jesus. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. No, First Peter chapter 1, 
starting in verse 3. We have a, a rock like Jesus. We should be thankful. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. According to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be, to be revealed in the last day, wherein you greatly rejoice, for now, for though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trials of your faith, being much more precious than the, than the gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ, whom, whom having not seen you love, and whom, though not ye see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory." receiving the end of your faith, even the everlasting, even the salvation of your souls. The fact that Jesus has provided us an inheritance that will, that's incorruptible, undefiled, it will not fade away. What a blessing Jesus is. He's our rock. And I appreciate that song, Brother Bates, about Jesus a rock in a weary land. I appreciate that too. Another reason we can count on Jesus as our rock is that Jesus will never change. Hebrew 13, 8 says, you know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He, he's always the same. He's not wishy-washy. What he said in the Bible will always be what he judges us by. His word will judge us in the last day. John 12, 48. The word that I spoke will judge you in the last day. That's a scripture we need to put in our memory. The judge, we will be judged by his word that he had spoken in the last day. Jesus is a rock who is in fact the word itself. John chapter one, verses one through four states that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning. All things were made by him and without him was not anything that was made, made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So basically, Jesus is a word. And he was with God in the beginning. Look at verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we're thankful that that flesh dwelt among us. You'll see it a little bit later. Why we should be thankful that he dwelt among us. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Another reason we can count on Jesus as our rock is, is that he make intercessions on our behalf in our time of need. And I submit that our time of need is always, not, time of, not when things are bad, he, we're always in need. And he make intercession for us all the time. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. Another one of my favorites. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing that we have a great high priest, which is Jesus Christ, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. That's a rock that we can count on. He knows what we're going through. He's been tempted the same way, yet without sin. Remember that 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he will always provide a way to escape. If you, if you can't bear it, he'll find a way for you to get out. I believe that with my, all my heart. That's the kind of high priest we have that intercedes for us. Now, this passage, this next passage, if, if you haven't gotten the fact that Jesus is a rock that we can count on yet, this next passage will help you. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verses 34 through 39. In Romans chapter 8, one of the things I like about Romans chapter 8 is that if you look real close, 
we got it made as Christians. What I mean by we got it made as Christians, and maybe saying we got it made as Christians is not the right word. I guess we should say we are deeply blessed as Christians. We got God on our side there in Romans chapter 8. We got the Holy Spirit interceding and praying for us, and we got Jesus praying for us, interceding for us, all of them in, in, in Romans chapter 8. You just look at it, you'll see that. All three of them are, on, are praying for us, trying to make sure we make it. But let's look at this portion of Romans chapter 8, the latter part of Romans chapter 8, verses 34 through 39. Who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died? Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. Who, sh who shall separate us from the love of God? I'm sorry. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations, shall distress, shall persecution, shall famine, nakedness, peril, sword, as it is, is, is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor, thi nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord our rock. That's another reason. You can go on and on about that. This is just, just, just a little bit that, that you can take home this evening. But with a love like we saw described in Romans chapter 8, at the, at the latter part of Romans chapter 8, with a love like that and a spiritual rock, rock like Jesus Christ, what should our response be to that kind of love? I submit it should be just the opposite of what the Israelites' response was in, in Psalm 78. You remember them, what their response was. Our response should be much different. Some of what our response, that I jotted down here for us to take home tonight, our response should be, in my opinion, for me, would be to just imitate, imitate Paul. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And, and, and I want you to remember that verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, and the way I want you to remember is you see all these ones just line up, just imitate one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. You see all those ones? I see them, and, and that's what I want you to see. They're just imitating one another. That's, it helps me. All right, so we can, we can, our response would be to imitate Paul, and we'll look at some other ways we can imitate Paul. But we can also imitate Christ. 1 Peter 2, 21 says, you know, Christ suffered and uh, left us an example that we should imitate him. I'm, I'm looking at the clock here, but First uh, Peter two and twenty one said, "For even there, for even here unto ye are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps, follow Him." Now, this is another one of my little quirks. If you see First Peter two twenty one, you see the one and the two, and the two and the one. Those are mirror images. They kind of mirror one another. So to me, I can see that as following one another. But it helps you to know, if you're trying to find those scriptures, how to know where they are. Okay. Now, another one I want you to look at of what our response could be like. And like I said, there's many other, other ones. But I want us to look at Habakkuk. Oh, Habakkuk. Now, this is the response we need to be, we need to have because of the rock we have. Habakkuk was complaining because he didn't understand what Jesus, why God was doing certain things, you know, how he was using people that were evil to go against Judah, you know, and he just didn't understand. He was complaining, and, and so Jesus, had, God had to teach him something. And let's look at it at the end of his prayer, Habakkuk chapter 3, 16, another one that I, I want you to take home, because Habakkuk is just like, 
I look at him just like me, because sometimes I'm like that. But then you got to see God knows more. His thoughts are not my thoughts. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I don't need to be worried. I need to just trust in God, trust in Jesus. And Habakkuk learned that. As he got through praying, he says in verse 16 of Habakkuk 3, he says, When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I may rest in the day of trouble when he cometh up unto the people. He will invade them with his troops. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, the labor of the oil shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flocks shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stall. There's some bad times we're back we're going through. Uh, or he would imagine that it could happen to him. He said, even if all that stuff happened, he said, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singles of, of my string instrument. When we're using that figure there as God there, but I see God and Jesus, we see them as the same. He's our strength. He's our refuge. He's our rock. What other thing can our response be to a, a person like Jesus Christ, a rock? The next one I have is we need to be content with the things that God has given us and stop being so anxious. And I hope that's, this next one is going to be that. I hope you can see that. Can you read that back there? Can y'all read that? That, that came from uh, Brother Michael Marshall about, about a week ago. And it, it, one of those things that helped me is to look at, you know, you got to be content, you know, about things. And he, he said, if you look at what you have in life, you'll always have more. Just be content. You'll always have more. If you look at what you don't have in life, you'll never have enough. That was, that was powerful to me. And, and so I appreciate it. I wish Michael was here so he could see that. But I told him I was going to use that tonight in my talk. It's telling me I need to be content with what God has provided for me, what Jesus has provided for me. Whatever it is, be content with it. Because God knows what I need and not what I think I need. Uh, so that's one of our responses, to be content. Same thing with, with Paul over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. You know, he had the thorn in the flesh. He wanted that thorn in the flesh removed. He prayed, 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 prayed three times. Remove it, remove it. And he said, well, he finally said, your grace is sufficient for me. You know, that's what we need to do. God's grace is sufficient when we look at what he's done for us. Throughout our lives, his grace is sufficient. Hebrews 13.5, the same idea. Hebrews 13.5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be content. Hebrews 4, 6 through 7. Be careful for nothing, nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's a content person when we know that the peace of God is reigning in our lives. So those are, those are, I submit, those are some of the things we can do as in response to Jesus being our rock. That's just tip of the iceberg. But up to this point, I've been reminding us Christians about the blessings that Jesus is as our rock and what our response to him should be, to those blessings that he's given us. Just as Jesus provided salvation, God provided salvation to the Israelites when they were perishing of hunger, perishing of thirst, by having Moses strike the rock, and outpour life-saving water, just as 
that happened for them to have life-saving water. Jesus provides us salvation through the life-saving water of baptism. The water of baptism, remember, without baptism, there's no forgiveness of sins. Salvation is in baptism. Uh, we, we read in Romans 3 about all men of sin falling short of the glory of God in Romans 6. Wages of sin, death, the gift of God is eternal life. Uh, but we need to come in contact with the life-saving water of baptism, which, which provides us with everlasting life, physical life, is from the water that was in that rock for the people in the, in the wilderness. But the rock of Jesus Christ, that water, the spiritual water, when we go down in the water of grave of baptism, we're getting everlasting life, not just for six days or so. Jesus is our spiritual rock. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 through 14. This is where we go into that water. We're buried with him in baptism. Also, you're risen with him through faith in the operation of God. We don't know how that works. It's the operation of God when we go down into the water grave of baptism. But he, he raised him, who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and in uncircumcision of your flesh, he has quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, blot not your handwriting of ordinances that were against us, contrary to us, took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. They're talking about the old law, nailing it to the cross. That's what they're talking about. But in, in, in our way, baptism also is taking our sins and nailing them to the cross, getting rid of them so that we can have eternal life through baptism. Let's go to 1, Corinthians, 1 Peter 3, 21. Verse 22, baptism does now save us, not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh, but to answer or to appeal to God for a good conscience to what God? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Remember, he's at the right hand of God interceding for us. But when we go through the water grave of baptism, we are getting rid of the filth of our bodies and we have been, we are Resurrected with Christ, without the sins. Now, I want us to, just for a few more minutes, talk about this. Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Because Jesus was telling us about building his church in Matthew chapter 16. Let's start in verse 13. When Jesus had come into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, Some say that thou John the Baptist, some say Elias, and other Jeremiah's, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon but Jonah, for, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So let's, for a few minutes left, just indulge me a little bit about a map. I, I love maps. That map that shows where Caesarea Philippi is and just above uh, the uh, Sea of Galilee, if you see it there in the middle, Sea of Galilee and down where the Jordan River comes down, the Dead Sea is down below that at the bottom. That's where the Dead Sea would be. So Caesarea Philippi is, is at the top there. So Caesarea Philippi was at the northernmost part of Israel. It was at the foot of Mount Hermon, and it was different from the port city of Caesarea. I call it Maritima, uh, Tima. And the way I remember that is like maritime. It's on the coast. 
So there's two Caesareas around that place. One was Caesarea Maritime, the other one was this Caesarea Philippi. And it's kind of important. Uh, it was built by Herod the Great. It was, a, it was like a per pleasure palace for the Caesars. And it was situ situated at the foot or at the base of a huge rock cliff. Is there where Matthew 16 took place at the bottom of this cliff. And Caesarea Philippi was known as Rock City. And I have a, another picture that they purport to be uh, at the bottom of that. You can see the big uh, rock behind the, the, the water there. They, archaeologists say that may be the place. But it's, suffice it to say, it gives you an idea, wow, Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi to talk about building his, his church upon a rock and use that as a place to talk about building his church upon a rock, a rock city, Caesarea Philippi. And this right here is for people like Brother Passmore and people that build things. The bottom part of that picture is what they call the bedrock, where you get through all the sandy stuff and the, and the flaky soil, you get down to that dense soil, dense rock. When you want to build something that's going to stay, like the person that built their house upon the rock when the, when the rains came and the winds blew, it was stable if it's got a good foundation. If it's up there in that sand, it can be blown away by anything. I gotta hurry. All right, so in this passage about building the house upon the rock, a lot of people say, Jesus was saying, we're gonna build a house upon Peter, but, but let's look here. And Peter, the masculine word for Peter in Greek is Petros. And that means little rock, like the little rock, and like I felt after that play down in Frog Pond, little rock is Peter. He, he was saying, you are Peter, you are Petros, you're the little rock. But I'm building my church upon, not the little rock, but upon the Petros, which is a feminine word, Greek word for rock, which is large rock. And it's on the fact that he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That's where he built his church upon that statement that Peter made. The big rock. So, Jesus is our rock in a weary land. He's done so many things for us, and blessed us with salvation, blessed us with uh, uh, eternal home in heaven if we're Christians. But if you're not a Christian, all those blessings are not there, but they are, they're there for you if you obey the gospel. And you have to hear the word, you have to believe the word, and you have to repent of your sins, and you have to, be, and you have to confess that Jesus Christ, like Peter just said, Jesus, you're the son of God, son of the living God, thou art the Christ. Make that confession, then you're able to be baptized where you're, your sins are washed away, you're added to the church according to Acts 2, 4 to 7. Now you're in a place where all the spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus in the church, and you have that blessing of Jesus being your rock in a weary land, a weary time, through good times and bad times. So if you're subject to the invitation in any way, please uh, avail yourself to it as we stand and sing one stands of the song by Brother Banks. When we walk with the Lord, light of his word.